I have the great honor today of talking with our very own Dr. Karen DeSalvo, Google's chief health officer, who's been a guiding force for us at Google throughout the pandemic. Dr. Karen has had a long career working in medicine and public health at both Health and Human Services under Obama and as the public health commissioner in New Orleans following Hurricane Katrina. Good to see you, Karen. I'd also like to welcome Kenneth Fraser, Chairman and CEO of Merck. Ken has been with Merck for 28 years, with the last nine years as CEO. Merck's been at the forefront of research to prevent and treat diseases, including cancer and infectious diseases, such as HIV and Ebola. In addition to his role leading Merck through the pandemic, Ken currently sits on the Governor of New Jersey's Restart and Recovery Commission. Karen, Ken, thank you both for being with us today. Thank you, Arnold, now, for having me. Oh, well, it's my pleasure. Thank you, Karen, as well for being here. Now, first, we all keep hearing about the race for a vaccine, and there's a lot of information and misinformation out there. So let's just level set for a minute, since we have two great experts in the field here. There are multiple companies who are working on a vaccine and are all at different stages in the process. Merck has a near 130-year legacy of developing vaccines and is one of those companies. Merck. So Ken, can you talk us through where Merck is in this process, your timeline, and tell us about the different vaccines and therapeutics in development? Sure, I'm happy to. Let me start by saying, because this is a brand new virus, we've spent a lot of time on fundamental biology. That is to understand how this virus produces disease inside the body, the impacts that it has on the body, because that helps us to think about the desirable characteristics that we would have for a vaccine. So the vaccines that we are working on, and we're working on two different vaccines, have the following characteristics. First of all, both vaccines are based on proven platforms that have already demonstrated efficacy and safety. One is based on a modified measles virus platform, and measles vaccines have been used in billions of people safely. The other one is based on a vesicular stomatitis virus vaccine which is one that we just deployed effectively in Africa and in the Democratic Republic of the Congo with the recent outbreaks on Ebola. So we know these are two proven platforms that are safe and effective. Secondly, and importantly, they offer the promise of effectiveness with a single dose. And that's very desirable when you're talking about a global emergency program. If you have to use more than one dose, you have challenges around compliance, you have challenges around how quickly you can cause a community to be protected, and you have challenges around distribution, storage, et cetera. The last thing, of course, is can these feasibly be manufactured at scale? And both of these vaccines are vaccines that we have experience with, but the scale is far beyond any vaccine we've ever contemplated. The most widely distributed vaccine in the world is influenza vaccine, and there's two, mil two, two billion doses that are distributed every year. Now we're talking about protecting seven and a half billion people on the earth from this terrible virus. And I like to say that until all of us are safe, none of us are safe. Yes, thank you. Um, Karen, can you talk a bit about the different types of vaccines that are being developed, some of the complications and challenges, and how hopeful you are for one by the end of this year? Well, you know, Ken is right. The scale and scope of what we're what we're trying to do in this pandemic has never been um, tried before in the history of science. And I think what's giving me a lot of hope that we will have a vaccine um, that is approved and and beginning to be available by this winter is that the scientific community all across the world has been working in really an unprecedented collaborative fashion. Since the very early weeks of the pandemic, we've been looking at the, the virus itself um, since the genetic makeup was discovered and scientists across borders and across organizations have come together to not only lay out a scientific agenda, but really agree upon the approach to outcomes so that we'll know when the, when the vaccines are safe and effective. We're using, as Ken said, some very tried and true platforms or technologies that um, we know more about the safety and effectiveness and about distribution. We're also using some brand new technologies like the mRNA technologies that are um, in the, the couple of leading vaccine candidates in terms of timeline in the US right now. This essentially turns your body into a little manufacturing plant. 
So the, the innovation on the part of the scientific community is giving me hope, but also, frankly, they're doing it with rigor and with a, a way that is going to um, help us trust the science that is coming through the, the pipeline so that even as they're working to do this at speed or as quickly as possible by working in, in parallel rather than in serial, we're, we're going to get to goal as quickly as possible so that we can help uh, people all across the globe, as Ken described. This is not just a single person getting vaccinated, but we're not all, as he said so well, uh, we're not all safe until everyone is safe. Yeah. I'd like to ask all of you watching, you should see a poll come up on your screens. And the question is, would you participate in a clinical trial for a vaccine? Now, we'll take a few minutes to collect the responses. While we're waiting for a response, Ken, some companies like Moderna and Pfizer are a little further along than Merck in the clinical trials. Do you view them as competition? And you've said that the science can't be rushed. Can you elaborate on that statement? So first of all, I'm extremely optimistic, as Karen is, that we're going to get a solution to this problem because we have so many smart people and so many companies using so many different approaches. So to answer your question, I don't see those companies as competition. I think we're all in competition against this virus. And I think if those early vaccines, the mRNA vaccines that Moderna and Pfizer are producing, they offer the promise of speed. If they are effective uh, for people, that would be the greatest thing in the world. The best thing for Merck would be if people beat us to the finish line in, in a great way, then we could stop our work uh, because that would be a great day for humanity. Uh, so I don't think those people are, are competitors at all. I, I think as we think about this going forward as a company, uh, I think the most important thing for us is to make sure that we're bringing forward vaccines that can be used at a very large scale and, uh, and that people can feel trust in. So I, I'm very confident that those early vaccines will actually be uh, valuable, but I don't think one vaccine will do it. I think there will be different vaccines for different populations, for elderly versus children, for different people in parts of the world. And, and we had it, the experience in Ebola that says another important element of this is the trust that the public has in the process, as Karen said. Yeah, no, exactly. Now, we've seen just how challenging it was to manufacture and distribute enough PPE and then to scale a test for COVID. So let's say we have a vaccine, which is what is necessary to implement not just a national strategy, but an international strategy for vaccine distribution. We're talking about the entire global population, as Ken said. What, what are your thoughts here, Ken, on that topic? Well, I have to say it's unprecedented. Uh, I mentioned that we've only gone as high as 2 billion with an influenza vaccine, which is, of course, a well-established tried and true platform. So for all of us, as we try to think about scaling up, it's a thousand times bigger than anything that we've ever done before. And by the way, we're being asked to do it a hundred times faster than anything that we've been asked to do before. So this is a really big challenge. I think the other challenge that we have, of course, is that there's a certain amount of vaccine nationalism. That is to say, uh, the more wealthy countries want to make sure that the vaccines are used for their populations first. So we have to start to say, how can we make these broadly accessible around the world? How can we do this in an equitable way? How can we do it in such a way that we can get to the last mile? You know, we just talked about our experience with uh, our Vivo, our, our Ebola vaccine, but we've been trying to, to deal with an illness called uh, river blindness for years. And, and we have a drug called Mectazan, and it only requires a, one pill per person per year. And we have seen the difficulty getting to the last mile in places like Sub-Saharan Africa. So we have to recognize that the challenge of distribution and accessibility, and I will say again, the challenge of creating trust. The situation with Ebola was we brought the vaccine, but people were saying, who are these Westerners? And what are they doing? Are these people here to make us sick? Or are they here to make us well? And we're now seeing that lack of trust in our own population here in the United States. So accessibility, affordability, the ability to distribute these things. And then finally, this issue about trust is going to be critical to being able to get it to all seven and a half billion people in the world. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And we'll, we'll come back to that point, actually, because we have some data on that. Let's take a, a look at the first poll. So we asked whether you would take part in a clinical trial. And the answer is 43% of you said yes, 57% said no. And what do, you, what do you make of those results? Does that surprise you? You know, it, it, it doesn't unfortunately surprise me um, in, in general because 
trust not only in the, the vaccine itself when it's already been through the regulatory process is something that we're seeing uh, some concerning numbers about, that people are concerned about whether they can trust science, who they can trust in science, what's the messaging that that um, they're going to believe when, when it comes out. And this is built on a foundation, unfortunately, of vaccine hesitancy that we already have, not only in the U.S., but around the world. So we all have our work cut out for us to make sure that people are getting the right information at the right time, because that's going to save lives. It's going to help them know what they can, what is the right vaccine for them at, at the right time. My, my husband actually is enrolled in one of the trials. Uh, he's a healthcare worker. And I, I use him as an example uh, from our own family of how much we trust the scientific process, having uh, been involved in it in different ways. But now um, he, he is the subject in, in one of these uh, well-designed, randomized control trials, these large phase three studies that will be the necessary step to get us towards the regulatory process. When in that process, there will be very um, experienced scientists in uh, regulatory bodies all across the world, including here in the U.S., who will be looking at primary data and um, going back over all the analyses and the, the protocols that the scientists have been involved in in these studies to look for the efficacy and the safety mm -hmm. of these vaccines. And then beyond that, um, there, Alan, there's a, a series of steps that are advisory bodies. So the FDA will decide when um, the product is ready and available in the U.S. for, for the vaccine to be given to the public. Yeah. And the CDC will make a decision in partnership with others like the National Academy of Medicine or the um, Advisory Committee for, for Vaccines on who should get it in what phases. And we're, we're already making those plans, of course, for people. But step one is to get the science uh, not only right, but robust and complete so that people will believe in that. Um, and, and part of that is to make sure people are enrolling. I just want to make one more point about this, which is um, uh, something Ken said, which is that these first generation vaccines we have may be only applicable to some populations. And we'll have to have additional vaccine generations going forward. Maybe we can talk a little more about some of the the challenges with these early these early generation vaccines, but very critically, um, we need people to enroll from different walks of life, um, people from from black and brown communities. We need people of all age groups because that helps us understand the effectiveness and the safety of these vaccines in those populations as well. Yeah, hey, well, speaking of this is transparency. I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead, Ken. I was saying that I think one of the keys to trust is transparency. Um, we need to tell the public what we know. We also need to tell the public what we don't know. And I would hope that some of the vaccine pauses that we have seen in the last couple of weeks should reinforce to the public that there is a system of looking very carefully at the data that is coming out of these clinical trials and focusing primarily on safety. Because if we're going to vaccinate large numbers of healthy people, we have to be sure that we know enough to to ensure that we're not going to do harm when we expand this from 30,000 people in a clinical trial to millions or billions of people. I just Absolutely. want to underline what he said, because it's so important, Alan, that people read in the headlines that there was a pause in a clinical trial, that we've had a couple of pauses for some vaccine trials recently and, and for a therapeutic. This is actually the normal part of the scientific process, and it should be actually reassuring to people that the that the infrastructure that that is looking at safety, for example, is working. That it's taken a pause so that the scientists can dig into the data and understand if this is an event related to the trial or an event that would just be normally occurring in the population. Yeah, it makes great sense. You both men mentioned efficacy. So Dr. Fauci has said that he could live with a vaccine that's seventy five percent effective and that to achieve that, we would need to see at least 75 to 80% of the US population be vaccinated to get the virus down to a level where we could get reasonably back to normal. So the, the polls on this are quite disturbing. So in, in a poll uh, by Pew from May, 72% of the US adult population said they would likely get a vaccine. By August, a Gallup poll reported 65%. And in September, another Pew poll reported that only 51% of the adult population said they would be likely to get a vaccine. So I thought, we'd, let's just take a quick poll of the audience. Would you take a vaccine as soon as one is available? So while, while we wait for that poll result, I'd love to hear from you both on this. Ken, those latest numbers are obviously way off from what Fauci believes we need for a vaccine to be effective. Are you worried about trust in public health and vaccines, seeing the way these numbers are sliding? I'm extremely worried about trust. Um, you know, in Merck, we often say that vaccines don't protect people. From, from diseases. Vaccination 
protects people from diseases. And if people won't allow the vaccine to be administered, if we can't put the shot in people's arm or if we can't swish it if it's an orally available vaccine, then that's going to be as big a challenge as the, the lack of availability of the vaccine in the first place. If the vaccine's sitting on a shelf, it can't help people. So uh, coming back to what I was saying before, I think what's critical is for the industry as well as for public health people to be open and honest with people about what it is that we know, what it is that we don't know, so that people can make an informed choice. Uh, but we live in a society where there's a lack of trust for all institutions right now. And that's not just a question about vaccine safety. It's not just a question for the FDA or the CDC. We have to be able to cause the public uh, to understand that what we're doing is in their best interests. Yeah, you know, um, Alan, tr trust is uh, job one in medicine. It's one of the first things that um, you have to to learn to listen and to have an open heart and open mind with your patients, especially new ones. And um, I practiced most of my career in New Orleans um, with low income communities, uh, particularly African American community. And they taught me very early about uh, trust in institutions and particularly because of historic challenges and, and interventions like the Tuskegee experiments, their, their lack of trust of, of the medical and public health community. So there are some, some um, populations where we have uh, extra work to do for historic reasons that they have valid concerns based upon history. On the other hand, what we know today is that vaccines are safe and the science that develops them is is, is ethical. And so we want to make sure that we get that message out. This is um, such an important tenet of what we're doing here at Google. And, and a big part of my job and my team's job is to partner with public health authorities and agencies all across the world, starting with the World Health Organization, all the way through to state and local uh, governments where we can to make sure that the right information is available to people about how what's the life cycle of a, vac a normal vaccine and and what should they know about about how the COVID vaccine is being made? And then, of course, when available, where they can go to get it, where, where it will make the most sense. We've been involved in that process already with just general COVID information, with helping people know if and when and where to get tested. So we'll be um, doing that same sort of work with people all around the world around, around the COVID vaccination. But we always do that um, in partnership with public health or other authorities. And so I'm I'm uh, as always, really delighted to hear public health spoken about so much um, in our conversation today, including uh, from Ken, because he's exactly right. This is uh, bigger than any one institution. It's bigger than any one sector. If we're really going to not only tackle COVID, but all of the important preventive and public health challenges we have around the world, it's what we all do together as a society to create the conditions in which everyone can be healthy. And Google is really proud to be able to partner with public health to improve that trust in the community. But we know this is going to take um, a, an awful lot of work in the next many months to years. Thanks, Ken. Let's take a quick look at the poll results. So the question was, would you take a vaccine as soon as one is available? And this audience uh, votes 68% yes, 32% no. So quite a bit better than the Pew poll I cited, but still surprisingly low for group. Um, but uh, we, I think we've talked about how in, information become, you know, how we're going to try to make information available once it, uh, um, once it is, once the vaccine is approved. But let's pivot to um, talking, Karen, maybe you can just quickly explain why does Google have a chief health officer? Well, every company should have a chief health officer. Um, but uh, I, I joined the company now just about 10 months ago. And um, uh, I, you know, I, I came from a background of practicing medicine and teaching medicine and public health and working in public service at the local, state, and national level. So I, I um, had this experience professionally of knowing that there are a lot of ways to improve the public's health. And in particular, um, often job one is being able to get the right information to people to save their lives. Um, this can be, you know, evacuate for a hurricane or a wildfire or, or know which vaccine to get and, and when. In a company like Google, um, people come to us by the billions every day to ask for information. And so just this, this notion that, that we could be available to be a trusted resource and to improve the content that we can make available in partnership with others is a big pull um, and a really important priority for us to see that we're meeting those expectations on the part of the public. It's also uh, an opportunity for this company where, you know, really health is in our DNA. It's a part of quality of life. It's the way that we think about improving uh, people's uh, pro economic prosperity and, and their opportunities to live the life that they want to live. 
And so we have tools like artificial intelligence and computer vision that can give superpowers to doctors and to public health professionals, to researchers that can help them do better work to improve individual and, and population public health. So our, my portfolio here is broad. Uh, it was very accelerated and um, has been uh, quite COVID focused since I joined just a few months before the pandemic. But it's been um, uh, gratifying to be able to be here at a time when I know people need information and we're, and we're able to pull together that in partnership with public health. Well, we're very fortunate to have you. Thank you. Uh, now I want to pivot to an important area that's been heightened during the pandemic, health inequity. So data has clearly shown this COVID has disproportionately affected people of color and black and brown communities. Ken, you're one of only four African-American CEOs of a Fortune 500 company. And this is an issue you've been very outspoken about since the George Floyd protests you know, began. You've been open about your own story, being bused to an integrated school at a young age and how that changed the trajectory of your life. So how does your unique position shape your thinking with regards to health inequity and disparity during this crisis? So, you know, I grew up on the other side of the track, so to speak, and my family and my friends still live in areas where they don't have access to good health care. Uh, and so I have to think as an African-American person with a platform that I need to point out all the continuing vestiges of our terrible history when it comes to race uh, and how they manifest themselves in a criminal justice system that doesn't treat people equally, in an educational system that doesn't assume that every child can uh, reach its full potential and make a contribution, and a healthcare system that doesn't treat uh, everybody uh, as though their lives are equally valuable, uh, in an economic system where various people can't be included and participate uh, in our economy. You know, in our country, the reality of the world is that your zip code is more determinative of your life expectancy and the quality of your life than your genetic code is. And we spend a lot of time sequencing the genome to try to understand how we can better treat uh, people and help them live longer, healthier lives. But the social determinants of health, uh, and, and Malcolm Gladwell talked about some of them. He talked about diabetes, he talked about hypertension, he talked about other issues. Uh, what this pandemic has done is it's unmasked the unevenness of our society and the inequities of our society. And those things actually directly manifest themselves in this uh, disparate impact that COVID's had on black and brown people. Yeah. Yeah, and I know you're passionate on this topic as well, having run public health in New Orleans following Hurricane Katrina. It's also an issue that we care about deeply at Google and we're looking at ways that technology can help. Can you share some of the things we're doing to help fight these inequities? Yeah, Alan, I just wanna start by thanking Ken for his um, outspoken leadership and being such a, important role model for everybody um, around the world and speaking the truth. This is um, the lessons from COVID that are on the front page of the newspapers or in the headlines that there are disparate impacts of this virus in communities of color and uh, on, in individual people of color. Maybe news to some folks, but it's a reality that many of us in medicine and public health have known for generations, unfortunately. And you know, following Katrina, I, I think for me, the um, even even though in doctoring on the individual level, I knew the disparate impacts, okay. and we were working on improvements to our system. It's really seeing the um, the gap in 25 year life expectancy in a community like New Orleans uh, mapped out in a hotspot um, in my community that three miles apart. It was a generational difference just based upon your address, ir irrespective of the other kinds of access that you had was really um, uh, a call to action for me and for many of us in that community that it's not just about choices people make, it's the choices they have available to them in those communities. And, and systemic racism and years of redlining and policies that have caused people to not even have access to the kinds of choices that many of us take for granted is something that we have to overcome. It's not just about access to better care. It's about access to environments where we live, learn, work, and play so that everybody can have that kind of, that kind of opportunity. Google is committed to not only helping uh, partner with, with groups like the Satcher Institute at Morehouse to get data out so that more of those sorts of maps can tell that story clearly for people so they understand what the COVID disparities are. But how can we begin to make, act, make action, to take action based uh, on, on what we understand about disparities based upon race and ethnicity in people uh, all across this community? And then frankly, the disparities uh, all across the world uh, based on different, on different differences. 
So we're, we're committed to it. I personally am. And it's one of the reasons that I'm, I'm uh, really uh, thankful that uh, we can be at a place like this at Google where we can help lift up the data to help people take the right actions that they need to take. Yeah, that's great. Thank you both. You know, I think we'll skip the, the, the last question for me and go straight to, um, straight to audience questions because um, you know, we got a little bit of a late start and I want to make sure we get everyone's questions in. So if we can uh, help with that, um, maybe while we wait for that to get queued up, uh, can we talk just a little, Karen, about the return to office and return to work and some of the issues that you've uh, managed through and what data and guidelines you look for? We're, we've been um, very uh, aggressively work, going to work from home early in the pandemic. It was something that leadership of the company felt strongly that we needed to not only protect Googlers, but it was something we could do as part of flattening the curve um, and keeping that flat in the community, not only in the U.S., but in our offices all over the world. And so we um, look at a mix of, of indicators or barometers about, about the degree of risk in a community. It includes individual level transmission. It includes the capabilities and capacity of the local public health and healthcare infrastructure, um, as well as whether and how we can work from home. I mean, we've learned as a company that we can largely work from home. And so to be a part of this global effort, um, which is going to be many, many more months down the road. We want to continue um, to, to have this posture where we're, we're doing everything we can to decrease the potential of transmission because we're moving in, in, in through public transportation or going into the, to the workspace. So we're right now in a work from home posture until the end of June 2021. And beginning to think about beyond that time window and, and um, frankly, beyond a time when we've uh, developed a vaccine that create sufficient protection for people around the world, that we can reimagine what the next generation of work will look like, not only for our employees, but for that pipeline of employees that we want to attract in the future. So very scientifically grounded, uh, conservative posture, but looking forward to um, using this opportunity to kind of make sure that we're thinking about what 21st century work really can and should look like. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, uh, why don't, we, why don't we go to the viewers' questions? And I also want to welcome back Malcolm Gladwell, who is back with us. Mm -hmm. Now, remember, you can ask your questions. We have the Q&A feature on the website. Um, and uh, let's see if we can get the first question up. How do the strong link, weak link paradigms for solving problems apply to eradicating structural racism, which have livestock consequences for those that carry you know, the generational and, uh, weight and stigma uh, that was referred to earlier? Malcolm, you want to take that one? Well, wow, it's a, a really good question and a really hard question. <laughs> I guess I should say I, I don't really know. Um, I, but like anyone who's interested in this issue, I have been um, frustrated at how slow the pace of eradicating structural racism has been in this country. We've been at it for, uh, you know, since Civil War in an aggressive way, or at least since um, uh, that period after that. And we have, we've made some progress, but not nearly enough. Um, I guess I would say the weak link paradigm would suggest that our efforts need to be more broadly distributed and we need to be thinking outside of uh, major institutional change. So we tend to look to the courts, for example, for a lot of redress to these kinds of things. And I'm wondering whether the weak link paradigm says maybe we should be looking beyond the courts. Maybe there are other, you know, maybe what goes on at the local level um, with state, you know, with municipal ordinances or zoning rules or all those kinds of things, maybe that's a more appropriate place for us to spend our time and attention. Yeah, yeah. Hey, can Alan, if I could just give an example. I was going to say, if, can I, if I, I could give an example, I think it's a great, um, uh, you're exactly right to look outside of the traditional medical paradigm, uh, Malcolm, but I'll give you a, a medical example from our time after Katrina, which was, we faced this 25 year gap in life expectancy uh, in our community. And in looking at the ways that we could identify that weakest link, essentially, rather than invest in high end hospitals or the academic medical centers that were destroyed and closed, we chose to focus on frontline care. And, and that was to build out a primary care infrastructure in neighborhoods in partnership with community. And then a next 
gen of that was to build out a strong public health infrastructure that could address some of these broader public health drivers like violent and, and mental health challenges. So there are, um, and that's our community example. There are plenty of others around the country where I think your, your um, framework there, Malcolm, makes a lot of sense to the way public health thinks about how to step in and identify the weakest link for the health and, and um, quality of life for people and begin to try to try to make a difference in those ways. And may I make a quick comment about the avenues that we should be using? Uh, you know, I'll start with a story that, you know, I used to teach uh, a, a law school in South Africa during apartheid. And in many ways, when I traveled from the United States, I saw some of the things that I saw in the United States. Obviously, there was a huge set of disparities between Black South Africans and white South Africans, a huge amount of hopelessness amount, Black South Africans, income inequality, et cetera. I think one of the big differences, though, between the United States, besides our stated creeds, is the business community. The private sector has the resources, it has the talent, it has the infrastructure to make an impact on these vestiges of historical racism. And so I talked about economic inclusion. Wealth creation is largely a function of the private sector in this country. And there's about one and a half million African Americans between the age of 18 and the age of 30 who are unemployed, who have high school degrees or GEDs, and largely it's because we have a failed education to employment system. And I think companies that have taken the lead in certain other areas, for example, with respect to environmental sustainability, we need to have racial sustainability in this country or we're going to kick the can down to future generations to deal with these horrible challenges. We can't just wait until the George Floyd situation happens and then respond to it with nice statements and contributions. The business community can make economic inclusion for Black Americans a reality. Yeah, no, I think that's very well said, Ken. Thinking of Malcolm's perspective matched up with the discussion, do we need to be taking both strong link and weak link approaches to get our world back on track? And what's required for that to come to life? Um, maybe, uh, uh, Karen, do you have anything on that? Of course you throw me that difficult question for starters. Um, uh, <laughs> I, I do, I, of course the answer is it's going to have to be a little of both, right? Because we know that if we want to, if we want speed and, um, rigor in the scientific process, there is infrastructure already built and in the world globally, whether that's in the scientific infrastructure for research trials or if it's in the regulatory apparatus. So we want to make sure that we're strengthening those leading institutions because we want the work to find a cure, to find a vaccine for COVID, to be rigorous and quick and safe and, and, and to find an effective treatment. On the other hand, um, if we only focused on that, we would miss this point that Ken raised, which is um, it's not about a vaccine, it's about vaccination. And the vaccination happens in... Um, a very local level and in, 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 in with basic, uh, I was, I was going to say hand-to-hand -hand combat, but that sounds really dramatic. What I mean is, is that on the front lines with community health workers and um, uh, faith-based leaders who can really work with communities to help them understand and translate the science into what matters for them uh, on a daily basis. So it, unfortunately or fortunately, it's going to take a mix of strategies, is my opinion. Can yeah, I just make I another struck by when, um, when I was listening to can um, this the, the, this dichotomy? I mean, I, we're at the, we're talking about the most sophisticated science coming out of one of the most sophisticated uh, high tech companies in the world, Merck, and yet we then we take a poll and we see or we we talk about polls that say that the majority of Americans are have kind of grave reservations about even trying one of these vaccines, and there's there's the gap that we're talking about, right? We're really, really good at the real at the hardest questions, making a vaccine for a completely unknown virus. We're really bad at the really common sense thing of, of convincing our population that you ought to take it. And you know that's that's weak link, strong link problems in a nutshell, right there. Can I just make a quick comment? Thank you, Malcolm, for introducing me to the concept of strong link uh, and weak link. You talked about the example of the investment we make in the already strongest uh, colleges and universities in this country. Let's take it down a level and look at how we allocate public education in this country. We allocate it largely on the basis of a parent or guardian's ability to afford real estate that is proximate to the best schools. And if you can't afford that, I mean, my life story is that I'm um, best from the inner city of Philadelphia to the best schools. 
the white schools in the Philadelphia area. So if a black child's parents are disadvantaged, those outcomes get passed down to that child. And to me, that's a classic example in our country. We don't invest in young poor people, not just African-American people. We don't invest in preschool. We don't invest in quality education for that segment of the population. And I think that's a classic strong weak link, weak link example of how we invest in education below the, edu of the university level. Yeah. yeah. Well, it goes to my, what I was saying before about, you know, uh, there's a really fascinating observation I heard recently, which is that over the last generation, we have spent more and more time discussing national issues and less and less time discussing local issues. The decline of local media is a part of that, but it's just also the rise of a, of a, a kind of a national political conversation that drowns out local issues. And this goes to the heart of what you're saying, is that you know, today we are absolutely focused on a Supreme Court nomination, which will deal with issues at the highest, so almost conceptual level. Meanwhile, the stuff you're talking about is all stuff that is adjudicated and carried out at the lowest level of government, right? And that is, we have got to find a way to bring our focus back to these unglamorous, you know, uh, non-fancy, nitty-gritty issues that affect people every day. Yes, Great. couldn't agree more, Malcolm. Malcolm, I know you have to leave us now, so thank you so much for joining us today. Ken, Karen, if you can stay just another five minutes, we'll uh, we have a few more questions for you. Thank you, Malcolm. Thank you, guys. So we'll switch back to the to the audience questions. There's a lot of conversation about vaccines on this call and in general. What about therapeutics? If we know how to get the death rate down in high risk groups, um, you know, does that uh, and whether you can get reinfected, that would make a lot of people feel safer. And as we all know, that will have an impact on both uh, health and and the economy. So, how do you think about therapeutics and the role they play? Uh, it's such an important question. Uh, you know, when we think about addressing an emerging infection or a, a pandemic in this case, we think about countermeasures. So what are all the things that we can be doing to prevent transmission, to uh, support and treat people when they're sick, and then to either cure or prevent uh, ultimately down the chain? We've actually had a lot of great advancements um, in not only some therapeutics, some treatments, We've had great advancements in the medical community's understanding of how to provide supportive care. We don't talk about that as much, um, but I will share for folks to know that the medical community has been very actively um, creating networks to communicate the best practices for when to intubate somebody. We've learned that we don't need to do it as early as we thought. We've learned that we can provide supplemental oxygen in prone patients so that they're using their own body to help oxygenate parts of their lungs. We've learned about anticoagulation. So we're getting better just generally at medical treatment in a really rapid iteration and there are new therapeutics that have come out and the science in those is also becoming more rigorous. We're leaning more on randomized controlled trials and, and some infrastructure and apparatuses the foundation for that globally. Some of the early science we saw was kind of cohort work or not randomized trials, and it was really difficult to understand medically how that should change our practice. But that, that certainly we're stepping up with antivirals, we're learning about steroids, we're learning about uh, monoclonal and polyclonal antibodies, as well as uh, other, other drugs like inter uh, interleukin-6. Um, so we're, we're well on a good pathway. And I think this is one of the things I always try to tell people is um, when we can take, when we have better therapeutics that takes more pressure off the healthcare system so that it can be there when people need, need, need it. And it does, as the question asks, take a little pressure off the timing for the vaccine. In the case of, of COVID, I just want people to remember that literally every hour of the day, the medical community is learning new things about this virus. She is protean in her manifestation. She is still teaching us how she's going to present, how she's going to impact people's bodies, and for how long. So it means we have to continue to be very judicious and careful about becoming infected because we don't really understand yet even what a mild infection does to people's bodies long term. So I would just say that's a great question because the industry is also seeking medic medicines, antivirals, um, and other medicines that have the potential, as Karen just said, to reduce the severity of illness among people who are already infected. At Merck, we are very optimistic about an orally available antiviral therapy that we are working on, which would be a convenient formulation that would alleviate some of the burden on our hospital systems, as we just said. We're hoping to be able to use it for people who are recently diagnosed in the outpatient context 
because obviously the faster you take down the virus, the less harm it can cause. So we're very excited. You look at the analogy of HIV. People years ago thought we would have an HIV vaccine by now. We don't have one, but we have very good medicines that reduce the virus's impact on people. And we're hoping the same thing can be true, as Karen said, because then it takes the pressure off having to, in some ways, rush a vaccine to the population. Yeah. Okay. So my last question uh, is really, what are you most optimistic or hopeful about as we continue to manage through this terrible pandemic? Well, I believe in science. It's that simple. I believe in science and I believe that we will find solutions over time. The other thing that I'm optimistic about is that I think that um, as Americans, um, I think it's important for us to think about how we can work together to solve our broader societal challenges. I like to believe that we're logical people. I think Americans at, at core are rational, tolerant, hopefully enlightened people uh, who will work on these problems and solve them over time. That's well said. I, I am also very optimistic about the awakening of, of many people to science and public health and the importance of having rigor in that process. Uh, I think uh, when we can get overcome some of the challenges of trust, at what we've talked about a lot today, uh, that, that my hope will be that we carry forward with this grounding in, in how important it is to understand the germ theory of disease and, and act upon that. I also um, agree about the sense of community and the sense of the responsibility that we all have to work together to create the conditions in which everyone can be healthy, that definition of public health, that we're learning it's not just what one institution or agency does, it's how we all work together and bringing our best assets and resources and really putting community first, um, not only in the case of a virus, but in all the other challenges that we face. Yes. Well, sadly, we're out of time, although I wish we could carry on. Thank you so much, Ken and Karen, and of course to Malcolm. Thank you. And can I just say one more thing? Please vote. <laughs> it's very important. <laughs> Including at the local level, as Malcolm pointed out. Yeah, we got to pay attention to all of our local stuff. Alan, thank you so much. And Ken, it was, it was great to spend some time with you. So, Same here. That, yeah. well, thank you both.